Hi, it's Paul George again. Um, day two of our uh, informal history lectures uh, for History of Miami. I serve as resident historian, as I mentioned yesterday. We've got a lot of improvement today because instead of my being upside down, I had the phone in a vertical position, so we're in much better shape. Um, we're going to talk about Coconut Grove today, which has one of the most fascinating histories uh, of anywhere, I think, in Miami-Dade County, as well as Southeast Florida. And I put together a little outline, a very thin outline of its history, kind of to kind of keep me on track. It really has uh, so much going for it that uh, I wanted to really kind of flesh it out for the group. We may go a little bit longer today. We went about 10 or 12 minutes yesterday, and um, there was just a lot more I would have liked to have talked about. So I discussed this with uh, some of the good folks at History of Miami, decided to take it longer and maybe save uh, the last five minutes or so of the presentation today uh, for questions and answers. I'd be more than happy to do that. So if you want to just um, hold your questions until the latter part of the talk, say about 20 minutes after, uh, that might work out really well. Um, I I've I wanted just to hold off for a second because uh, I know people are still tuning in, not only people that missed some of the early history of Coconut Grove, but uh, just as a way of review, tomorrow we're going to talk about uh, Julia Tuttle, Henry Flagler, and others, and the birth of the city of Miami. Then we have a, a talk on Thursday uh, discussing uh, the great real estate boom of the mid-1920s, which is a very exciting period and something that I've put a lot of attention and research and writing into. And uh, subsequent lectures will be on um, early post-World War II Miami and the rise of this international city, uh, the Art Deco district of Barbara Kaplan and others. So we've got a lot of good things to discuss in the next couple of weeks. And I'm very, very excited about sharing it with you. Uh, but I wanted to talk about Coconut Grove. And again, when we put together this series in terms of topics, it just uh, sort of jumped out at me as a natural. It's, um, it's got such a neat history and it's such a beautiful area. And at one point, it was by far the liveliest part of Miami-Dade County in terms of life on the streets, uh, in the bars, in the restaurants, strolling along the parks, hippiedom, beatniks. Uh, it still remains a very important part of Miami, but let's begin to talk about Coconut Grove since it's a couple of minutes after the hour and I wanted to get moving on this. The land itself, the physical makeup of Coconut Grove is something that uh, is very, very distinctive. It's on a ridge that is high ground. Uh, it sits atop of beautiful Biscayne Bay. Uh, the woods, what we call a subtropical hammock, are very, very thick from the shoreline back, the equivalent of at least a couple of few blocks before development came. And then beyond that, as you're moving west in the area, you come to the Piney Woods, as you would in other parts of Miami-Dade County, as you kind of step back from the shoreline of Biscayne Bay. And so it's really absolutely a gorgeous area. We know that the Quest the Indians roamed the area, going back way back in time. Um, we know there was a road built as early as the 1880s, 1890s, Old Cutler Road, connecting with Ingram Highway, connecting with Main Highway, which is known earlier as Ingram Highway, that would co connect you with Deep South Dade. Uh, so those are some of the, the, the basic features of the area that I wanted to discuss. And I wanted to talk about early settlers uh, for which we have or for whom we have records. Among the earliest uh, was Ann and Ed Beasley sometimes called Ned Beasley, and they were there in the middle decades of the 19th century. And they lived in an area, of, and this, their boundaries were informal until they formalized it through a, a homestead they acquired. Uh, their boundaries included what would be Ralph Monroe's Barnacle today, the Barnacle State Park. Uh, and again, they were there in the, in the middle decades. Ed passed, uh, Ann lived much beyond them. And at one point, uh, Ann, at the outset of the 1870s, hosted on part of her property, a Union, Civil War Union doctor and surgeon, Horace Porter, who tried to jump her claim to that land a little later on and left. So I think in the minds of a lot of people in the South, he would have been what we call a quintessential carpetbagger, somebody who came down from the North to take advantage of the poor prostrate South in the aftermath of the Civil War. Whatever the case was, uh, Porter was a very ambitious guy. And uh, one of the things he did early on was he applied for a post office in 1873 very simple application in those days. One of the questions was, uh, what do you propose to call this proposed post office? As the story goes, he looked around, saw two coconut palm trees and said, I'm gonna call it Coconut Grove, C-O-C-O-A-N-U-T. And so 
We had this post off. We have no records of what happened there. Uh, I think it was probably a lean-to. It was probably growing over amid that thick hammock. Uh, Porter left by the mid-1870s after, again, failing to euchre uh, Mrs. Beasley out of her land. And not much was uh, known about the area at that point uh, for those who would come a little later on. The next uh, important iteration in the area's history, and I mean a very important iteration, was something called was the opening of something called the Bayview House, a.k.a. the Peacock Inn, about 1882 uh, by a British family, Isabella and Charles Peacock and their three sons. They had come to the the wilds of southeast Florida sometime before that, lived along the north bank of the Miami River in today's downtown Miami, had met Ralph Monroe, uh, whom they befriended and vice versa. Uh, One of the things that drew them here was the fact that uh, Charles Peacock's brother, Jolly Jack Peacock, was living at one point up around where today's Campong is, where um, essentially Main Highway meets Douglas Road. And he told them about the splendors of this area, which really didn't have a name uh, other than that, uh, that one fleeting reference to the post office. And so uh, the Peacocks came. Uh, Ralph Monroe, as time went on, uh, went back to uh, Staten Island, came back to the area uh, with a, a dying wife, a very young woman, Eva um, Monroe, and um, would talk the Peacocks into opening up this inn, this Bayview House, later known almost universally as the Peacock Inn, sitting where uh, the western edges of today's Peacock Park would be as you're moving up that incline into the town center itself. And uh, so this becomes sort of like an anchor for a growing community. And by the mid-1880s, a lot of people, very talented, eccentric people, writers and naturalists and artists and a preacher, a.k.a. Harry Beecher Stowe's son, Charles Stowe, uh, had landed in the area. They came as visitors. Many fell in love with the area and decided to, to live here, to build along the bay and uh, on that beautiful ridge amid that great subtropical hammock. And so you begin to see the makings of the community of Coconut Grove, and uh, the Peacock Inn becomes a magnet for it. And one of the I think the, the main sponsors of the area, a sort of a one-person chamber of commerce, by the mid-1880s, when he decided to make the area his permanent home, was Ralph Monroe. He had buried a wife, and later that he had buried a daughter, he buried a sister-in-law. So he came back here, I think, to reconstruct his life from the northeastern United States. And it was Ralph one day who, he was a great sailor, designed shallow draft sailboats, one of, the, one of his many occupations. And it was Ralph who... Um, who would uh, sail out to the uh, Fowry Rock Lighthouse. And um, there he saw a postal map that indicated that there was a post office in today's Coconut Grove. Now, there was no name to the place in the minds of these people who came in the 1880s. They didn't know about the post office. Some people earlier had talked about Jack's Bite, an indentation in the shoreline, a uh, name for likely uh, Jolly Jack Peacock. Others talked about the land across in the light because we know the lighthouse keepers sometimes would sail across the bay to the edges of today's Coconut Grove. So uh, it, had a, uh, it had a lot of informal references to it, but Monroe came back and said, hey guys, I got news for you. Uh, we got a name. I found out that there was a post office in our area by the name of Coconut Grove. So that becomes a steady reference to the place at that point. Meantime, more and more people are coming, more and more people are establishing themselves in Coconut Grove. And like any vibrant community, you begin to see the institutions of any community beginning to arise such as a woman's club in 1891, the um, Coconut Grove Housekeepers Club. Um, And then you have um, uh, a church that grew out of a Sunday school by the very pious um, Isabella Peacock, uh, and the the first school which we still have on the grounds of Plymouth Congregational Church. And uh, you have something called the Union Chapel, which was an ecumenical church, not only ecumenical, but biracial. Uh, because there was a rising black Bahamian community, as well as a sizable number of white Bahamians who populated Coconut Grove. And that rising black community lived along and around and near today's Charles Avenue, named for a white homesteader whose family, the Frau family, had owned that land. And he later on began to sell parcels of that land uh, to some of the black residents there, especially a man named uh, Ebenezer Stirrup, who became uh, the first black millionaire in Coconut Grove, a, a quintessential self-made millionaire. So uh, a lot of things are going on in the Grove, uh, and that Charles Avenue uh, uh, 
situation is really interesting. I tour that area X number of times a year, and uh, there's always a tremendous response when we post the idea of a tour, or even for a private tour. But both the black and white community briefly at the outset of the 1890s worshiped together uh, in this, what was called the Union Chapel, which was ecumenical. And later, the black group by the mid-1890s would break away and establish their own church. Uh, and they still have a church today, Macedonia AME Baptist Church at the corner of Douglas and Charles Avenue. Uh, so uh, we've got the vibrant community with the different organizations. Uh, you know, we've got a post office, so we've got a general store. Uh, out of the women's club comes... Um, a smaller group known as the Pine Needles Club. It's the young women of the club, of the neighborhood. And uh, they're very much into reading and they're led by Mary Barr Monroe, who was a tremendous environmentalist, uh, the daughter of a very successful 19th century novelist uh, uh, who came from Scotland, of course, uh, Mary Barr Monroe. And um, they form, or they organize, the first post office, excuse me, the first library. And the library stood roughly where Today's lovely library is the library that was built in 1963 as you're moving up the ridge just behind the Women's Clubhouse on uh, McFarland Road in Coconut Grove. And so, again, it's a very exciting place, and there's different events that go on on an annual basis. And um, The population of Coconut Grove, according to the U.S. Census by 1890, had already reached beyond 100 people, which was quite large for the area, especially when you consider that a part of the future city of Miami, the area uh, along the Miami River at its mouth had just one family at that point, the Brickles on the south bank uh, at the mouth of the Miami River. So Coconut Grove is a very going com community at that time, and it, again, has a lot of talented people. We mentioned the writers, or two titled counts, um, Harry Beecher Stowe's uh, son, Charles, you mentioned, Ralph Monroe, who's a sort of a Renaissance person who can do so many things, and he also possessed the first camera. And so the earliest recorded photographs we have of Coconut Grove going back to the 1880s came from his camera. And then to make things even better, his uncle Alfred Monroe, who was a quite elderly man, spent some of his winters there as late as the 1890s. And we have at History of Miami a lot of his photographs. He possessed maybe camera number two for Coconut Grove. So we've got a lot of records of the community, uh, both visual as well as written records. Um, the community matured. The community began to attract not only talented people, but a lot of people of wealth, such as John Binley, president of Pittsburgh Steel, who built El Hardin, that jewel of a building that's the, the bulk, the bulwark, the anchor of today's Carrollton School, the Sacred Heart on Main Highway. And uh, Arthur Curtis James, said to be one of the wealthiest people in the world, was there. Leo Bakelin, who was the inventor of Bakelite, uh, a progenitor of plastic. William Jennings Bryan, the great orator and politician and office holder. And it just goes on and on and on, some of the heavyweights that would come together, live primarily along Main Highway with homes that backed up to Biscayne Bay. And they form one of the three millionaire rows uh, in the Miami area by the early 1900s. Uh, as time went on, other things happened. In World War I, uh, a naval air station opened at Dinner Key. Dinner Key, a little island separated uh, from the mainland by just a handful of yards, depending on where the tide was. Navy took over that area. They dredged the marshy areas and solidified it with the mainland and built one of the first naval air stations in America, training over 1,100 pilots for service in World War I. Um, put a big fence that roped it off from South Bay Shore Drive, which incidentally was the first road that would connect today's Coconut Grove with what would be the Brickell Avenue neighborhood uh, near downtown Miami. And um, uh, the Naval Air Station then functioned into 1919, and the Groveites said, listen, as long as the war's going on, we'll put up with this, you know, the pollution, the noise, even some accidents, what have you. But when the war was over, it remained a training ground, and the Groveites protested, as did uh, the city of Miami's newspapers. So finally, the federal government uh, closed it in 1919. And what the Groveites did was, they said, listen, we need to get more muscle. Why don't we incorporate it as a community, and that way we'll, we'll have the authority and the formality uh, to pass laws, to create a police force, uh, to take care of water and sewage and things of that nature. And as a result of that, uh, Coconut Grove Incorporated, as a town in 1919, over on Mary Street, named for Mary Pent, another one of the early homesteading families 
uh, who secured 160 acres of land through that Homestead Act of 1862. Um, and, they, and they spelled it again, C-O-C-O-A and U-T, Coconut Grove. But at the incorporation meeting was Dr. David Fairchild, another one of the heavyweights who lived in the community. Uh, his uh, father-in-law was uh, Alexander Graham Bell, the great inventor. And uh, Dr. Fairchild was at the meeting, said, guys, I hate to tell you this, but coconut is spelled C-O-C-O-N-U-T. So we sort of need to revamp the spelling of, of this word, and they did. And within a couple of years, based on the growth of Coconut Grove, Coconut Grove then qualified for city status and became the city of Coconut Grove. But lo and behold, in early September of 1925, the city of Miami held a annexation election in Coconut Grove and the town of Buena Vista and the town of Silver Bluff, unincorporated areas that represent today's Alapata and uh, today's Wynwood, um, uh, parts of Little Havana were all annexed to the city of Miami. So Coconut Grove lost its uh, municipality status at that point. And it, a lot of people are unhappy as a result of that. Meantime, something else was going on. That Naval Air Station had really set a precedent, I think, for the advent of aviation in the area. And a man named Ralph O'Neill opened up a seaplane operation down at Dinner Key on the, uh, at the venue of the old Naval Air Station in the late 1920s. And lo and behold, by the end of the 1920s, Juan Tripp and Pan American Airways, which had only been founded in 1927 and had only come to the Miami area in 1928, bought Ralph O'Neill's airline and incorporated that into Pan American Airways, which later became Pan American World Airways. And they ran seaplanes, mainly Sikorsky built, out of that area to Cuba and other parts of the Caribbean and the West Indies. Also, Pan American built that uh, beautiful Art Deco style building as its terminal. It opened uh, in 1934. And that airline, its operations there, that terminal became one of the great tourist venues, the tourist attractions in the Miami of the 1930s, right up to World War II. A lot of people wanted to see that, and they wanted to see these planes coming in. They built the hangars, of course, that would be to the right of the terminal itself as you're looking toward uh, Bayshore Drive. Um, Coconut Grove continued to be a progressive area, a hip area, an artsy area um, with their writers and their artists and their art galleries. And um, all of this continues into the post-World War II period, a period of great expansion for both Miami, the county, and Coconut Grove. The Coconut Grove Theater, known as the Grove Cinema, was converted in 1956 into the Coconut Grove Playhouse, which really makes it a major uh, performing art venue. Um, artist galleries are across the street from there. In fact, uh, in 1963, uh, the Playhouse was presenting Irma LaDuce, and they said in order to generate enthusiasm or more ticket sales, bring more people to the presentations, uh, let's ask the artists in this quarter to uh, sort of set up shop as a Paris left bank, put their wares out around uh, what was then known as George Washington's birthday today, as President's Day. And they did that, and that marks the beginning. Its great success marks the beginning, 1963, of the Coconut Grove Art Festival, which is still flourishing all these years and decades later. So uh, that was, a, I think, a major nod to the artistic uh, relevance of Coconut Grove. Um, because it was a sort of a free-spirited area, it also attracted a lot of counterculture people, such as beatniks, uh, who began to flock to the coffee houses there and the bars there in the late 1950s, and used Peacock Park, where the inn formerly stood, now a city park, as a place to frolic on weekends and what have you. Uh, a decade or less later, you've got the hippies who almost take over the park, in fact. It becomes a great gathering place for them. Uh, their dogs, their frisbees, uh, sometimes bathing in the waters of Biscayne Bay. The wonderful St. Stephen's Church next door to the park would even let them use the telephone and didn't mind if they parked their vans across from the church. And sometimes they would just sit on these little blankets during the course of the day, and other times they would sleep on them or sleep in their vans. So it became a real counterculture haven at that time. In more recent times, it's undergone some intensive redevelopment, and a lot of high-rises are really flanking what is the town center. And the town center itself is going through a lot of changes, too, with office buildings filling what had been, for example, the Mayfair Mall and places like that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a very dynamic community with a very rich history. 
And it continues to portray that history, uh, the King Mango Strut. Isn't that ironic that the King Mango Strut grew out of the frustration of some Grovites to have a, a role as one of the acts, if you will, in the King Orange Jamboree? And when that was rejected, they started their King Mango Strut as an answer to that in 1982. Well, they're still going on, and sadly, the King Orange Jamboree has been defunct for about 15 years now. So you've got a lot of really interesting things that continue to go on in the Grove, but I think also the Grove's success as a gathering place, as a place where you get out of the car and walk around and see people and dine and buy whatever, uh, I think really helps spur the development of other neighborhoods to move in that direction too. And now we have a lot of neighborhoods in Miami-Dade County that go that way from the Art Deco District to Wynwood, the Buena Vista Design District to Little Havana, the, the downtown sections of South Miami, on and on and on. So I think at this point, since it's about 3.20, um, I'll take off my glasses and I'll field any questions anybody might have, or actually if the questions are posted, I'll keep my glasses on and and uh, try to answer some of these. I see something from Latanya Ohm. Dr. George, what beautiful old building which looks like it's from Louisiana. What's the story behind that building? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure which building that is, Latanya, to be honest with you. Um, I don't, I'm not real good with technology. My daughter set me up again today. She's the executive producer of this show, incidentally. Um, and I'd like to tap something you've got on here, but I'm afraid I might lose everything. So if you want to come back with maybe the location of the building, maybe I can help you with that. I also see from Ingrid, uh, Dr. G, were there any festivities that were shared between Bahamian community and white folks parades? Uh, it's a great question. A lot of white folks attended the Goon Bay Festival, which began again, I said again, in 1976, usually in early June, celebrating the rich culture of the Bahamas, especially the Black Bahamas. Actually, the first iteration of the Goon Bay Festival goes back to the beginning of the 1900s, and certainly a lot of white folks attended it, uh, patronized it over time. Uh, the King Mango Strut is open to all people and long has been. Uh, so, um, I'm not sure if I really answered your question directly, but there is participation by the races in many of the things that go on uh, in Coconut Grove. Another question, Dr. G, how did the Spanish flu pandemic affect Miami, South Florida? I'm going to call this the worldwide uh, flu pandemic of 1918, uh, rather than just tag the poor Spanish with it. After all, I am married to a Spanish woman. Um, it impacted Miami uh, severely, but very shortly. And boy, I wish that was going to be the case with us right now. Uh, it became a serious issue in Miami at the beginning of the second week of October of 1918. This was the last month of World War I. And at that point, there were several people who were suffering from it. And it caused within a week or so uh, the schools to close, the movie theaters to close, the houses of worship to close. And everything remained closed for the most part until the end of October. By the end of October, 87 people had already succumbed in the Miami area to this flu epidemic. But by the early part of November of 1918, the city and its outlying areas were open again. In fact, we had a huge, boisterous, as it should have been, um, Armistice Day celebration marking the end of World War I. That took place on November 11th of 1918. So we got over that quickly, and of course, it's everyone's desire that we can put this behind us. It looks like it might be a bit longer, though, unfortunately. Let's see what else we have here. Oh my gosh, we've got some interesting people. Uh, Karen McCammon is watching, and she's great. Longtime friend. Ingrid says, hi, Dr. G. George Zamanillo is watching. That's great. My boss. Um, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> executive producer. What is the story behind the grave, Mark Hewitt, a lady buried near the Coconut Grove Art Library? This is Jane Hewitt Moranos. I'm so glad you asked that question. It's the burial spot of 22-year-old 22 year old, 22 year old uh, Eva Hewitt Monroe, Ralph Monroe's first wife. He would marry again as a widower many years later. She's the woman who contracted tuberculosis. He brought her back to the Miami area at the outset of the 1880s to see if this warm, wet climate would help her condition, it didn't. She passed in the early 1880s. He interred her body on the north bank of the Miami River, but when he decided to make Coconut Grove his home in the mid-1880s, 
the body was disinterred and he buried her there. In fact, uh, the grave's always been marked, but there wasn't even a historical marker there until a handful of years ago. So uh, I just always marveled over how many tens of thousands of people had passed that during the art festival and at other events, not knowing its story. But now its story is portrayed really well in that marker, which I think is really great. Um, oh, here's Karen Corlett McCammon um, uh, helping to answer uh, the question posed earlier about the Louisiana style building. Karen says it's not an old building. It was a restaurant called Cafe Europa, and she's 100% correct. That building was built, I believe, as early as the 1980s, maybe even in the 1990s, portrayed as an older building from another place, and you're, you're so right about that. Glad that Jane and Paul are watching, and uh, Jane Hewitt says, wow, thank you. Here's Vivian, just being very, very nice from the WDNA and Miami Dade College. But uh, let's see if there's any more questions. And I thank you, Vivian. Let's see if there's any more questions. I'm more than happy to try to answer any. And I'm so glad that we have this forum that we can uh, share things. Um, I'm just kind of scrolling down. Leanna's watching, Ingrid's watching, George Swarmies. Drop off your questions and comments. Uh, Dr. George will answer as many. That's great. We have Annalise watching. Michelle is watching, of course. Um, well, let's do this then, uh, Vanessa, too. Let's do this. If there are any other questions, uh, we can conclude. Oh, uh, Karen mentions that in the early 80s, she and Bob McCann, and Bob at one time was the CEO of History of Miami, uh, they would visit Cafe Europe when they were dating. And um, I sure hope that Bob picked up those checks, and I'm sure he did. Um, I've got somebody here, Claudia from Madrid. I'm, I'm Orla Dalmati's daughter, and she always loved her job at the museum. Well, we loved Orla, and um, uh, she was really a special person as far as we were concerned. So I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in, and I'm excited about sharing with you tomorrow uh, the story of Julia Tuttle, Henry Flagler, Mary Brickle, and others uh, in concluding a deal, if you will, to bring the railroad to Miami and to birth Miami. As a sneak preview, if you can imagine this, according to the Florida State Census in 1895, just nine people lived at the mouth of the Miami River. The next year, the railroad entered Miami in mid-April of 1896. City was incorporated with maybe seven, 800 people in late July of that same year. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining me, and I look forward to... Uh, to sharing this uh, story with you about the birth of Miami uh, tomorrow. And incidentally, um, History of Miami has covered all of these topics uh, in Tequesta and a lot of our exhibitions in South Florida History Magazine. Uh, so all of these are easy references for you, this information. Uh, you can go online, in fact, and access um, Tequesta. And we're quite proud of that. That's a, a journal we've had in business now since the beginning of the 1940s when the museum began. But thank you all again, and I look forward to sharing with this, this with you tomorrow, okay? Have a great day. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.